I'm going to paint a picture for everyone. Um, paint a picture with numbers, which is what I really love to do. And I'm happy to be here to share my observations with you. Um, we all have a frame of reference that we use when we make decisions. Many of you, if you're not already decision makers, will be decision makers. Whether you realize it or not, that frame of reference becomes critical to the decisions that you make. How you form that frame of reference, you do it from your personal experience, you do it from interacting with other people, you do it from data. I'm here to take all of your individual experiences and the experiences of thousands of people in our samples that we use for the city, and I'm going to draw a picture with that. A picture that in scientific terms is called a representative picture. Those of you who've had your Statistics 101 know that numbers that are representative are very special numbers because they give you a picture of what's out there. We all have our images of what's out there. What I'm going to talk about today is about what our data tell us is out there. So we're going to test some, some common uh, observations that I, I'm sure will be near and dear to many of you. OK, so with that. Let's start, and let's start with an observation that I think we all have. The city is pretty crowded, right? Those of you who ride the subways know this. Those of you who walk the streets know this. There have been a few articles of late in the New York Times, New York Magazine, talking about the fact that it's crowded. Um, go see a Broadway show, get out from the Broadway show. It's hard to walk, right? A lot of density in the city. There's a reason for this, and we're seeing it in our data. This is the first point I want to make tonight. <clears throat> uh, my colleagues and I actually, when we sit down and we look at the current rates of growth in the city, we look back historically. And we asked ourselves the question, when was the last time the city was growing at this pace? And we were shocked, frankly. Because you have to go back to the 1920s to see rates of growth like what we have now. The city's population in 1900 was 3.4 million. The city was very big. It was just subsequent to incorporation in 1898. The city grew from 3.4 million in 1900 to 5.6 million in 1920 to 6.9 million, doubling from 1900, doubling. This was an era when the city grew from being a big city to being a metropolis, or some people have, have said, a metropolitan giant. In the 1920 to 1930 period, the city grew by about 2% annually. The city was adding about 120,000 people every year. But think about that era. Massive immigration. We were building our subways. We were building the infrastructure for the city in this era. That period was a period of extreme growth. Right now, when you look at annual rates of growth for the post-2010 period, 2010 to 2015, we're growing at about 9 tenths of a percent annually on a base of over 8 million people. What does that mean? It means each year we're adding about 75,000 people to New York City. So there is a really good reason why you feel crowded, why you feel there are more people, because there are more people. But there's a fact, and very important fact. There are limits to growth. Those limits relate to the city's infrastructure, especially housing, <clears throat> our capacity to absorb population. Herbert Stein was an economist in the 1970s, head of the Council of Economic Advisors under Presidents Ford and Nixon. He's known for many things. Um, being a, a great economist, but uh, he is the father of Ben Stein, who many of you might know as the star of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and also um, a, a noted uh, columnist and uh, uh, financial uh, guru. <clears throat> and he said back in the 1970s, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Um, I pulled this because our projections for the city's population show that over time, our rate of growth has to lessen. 
It cannot continue with this rate. We're talking about rates of growth in this decade that we think are going to tail off substantially. Why? Because there are constraints to growth, those constraints involving our infrastructure. We already see this happening on Staten Island. Staten Island once had very high rates of growth. In fact, if you go back to the time that the Verrazano Bridge was built in the 1960s, it was fantastic growth on Staten Island that was unleashed by creating that transportation link. What happened after that? Staten Island continued to grow, but now the infrastructure is being stressed. Staten Island right now has more people leaving than coming in. Okay? It's actually experiencing negative migration, outflows, because its rate of growth is down substantially. Again, evidence that ultimately you hit these constraints. So our projection through 2040 shows declining rates of growth in the city. Now, how do we do our projection? This is a census tract map of New York City, the Bronx. Keep in mind the only county of the United States, I'm sorry, the only borough or county of New York City that is connected to the US mainland. Everything else, we're on an island. We, we forget that. <clears throat> Physically, we are constrained. People ask me, why aren't we growing like London? London has space. There are many places where there are space. Their issues are more political in terms of growth and what they uh, consider to be reasonable. Up in the Bronx, you see these reds. This is percent change in housing density. This is the number of housing units or percent change in housing units per acre. Okay, the number, think about an acre, 200 by 200. Think about the number of housing units in that acre. If you take a look at 1970 and you compare it to 2010, the reds show declining density levels. Okay, this is where in the South Bronx, density in 2010 is actually lower than it was in 1970. Parts of Brooklyn, for example, Brownsville, um, East New York, down by Coney Island. Also, you'll see up in here, up in Bushwick, there are a number of places where you see these reds indicating that density has actually gone down in these places. The South Bronx, Mott Haven, Morrisania, all the way up by Bronx Park, lower density now. Now, we ask ourselves the question, what if we backfill these areas, which is what we did? And this is, this is what happens. You project growth to be highest in the Bronx between 2010 and 2040 because there's space in the Bronx and because the zoning currently allows for higher levels of density. 14% okay? level of growth we're projecting in the Bronx, 1.579, which is above, a bit above its historical high, which in the Bronx was 1970. It hit his historical high. So we're projecting 11% growth in Brooklyn. Why? Because Brooklyn, allowable density uh, is higher. And because in Brooklyn, uh, there is some space, as you saw earlier. Density levels were higher in the past. So we bring those density levels up to where they were in 1970. This is what we get. Queens, very crowded. Queens, low density for the most part. So what ends up happening is Queens, we project, will grow by about 7%. Staten Island, by about 7%. Uh, because these areas, again, lower density, their capacity has been uh, largely achieved that in essence we think that they can't go much further. Manhattan, does anybody know what the population of Manhattan was 100 years ago? 1920, what do you want to get? That's right, 2.3 million in Manhattan, okay? And a lot of that development was south of 59th Street. We are at one, we're projecting 1692 for, for Manhattan, about 7% growth because even in Manhattan, constraints become important over time. There are limits, again, based on space, based on current zoning. You'll notice I keep saying current zoning. Of course, if we change the zoning somehow, we change the land use going forward, then these numbers would obviously be altered. So we're projecting a hefty 10% increase for the city's population. Now, some of you might be surprised it's 9 million, and you say we're at 8.5 now, Salvo. How could you say 9 million? Uh, you know, because we don't go straight up. That's not how it works. We may have a recession next year. Something may stop housing development like it did last decade. We had projected a high number for 2010. We ended up being too high. Why? Because of the Great Recession. Another important point, and this is the one I love. For those of you who heard me talk about this, this is a demographer's dream, so to speak. 
I know that's kind of an interesting concept, right? <laughs> New York keeps reinventing itself to an extraordinary demographic churn. Many of you have heard the analogy. The cells in our body change from year to year, right? They regenerate themselves. What makes a global city is churn of population. If you go to a city that's kind of a city, but not really a city, it was incorporated as a city, where your friends don't get exhausted when they come and visit you, where frankly there are a lot of people on the street sometimes, but not all the time, that are in demographic trouble, <laughs> okay? Because they don't have the churn. Now let's look at how big the churn is for New York. Every year, remember I mentioned earlier, we are growing by 74,000 a year right now. Let's look at what goes into this. Between 2010 and 2014, 74,000 growth population annually. But look at what drives this. On the gain side, the population gains, we get 143,000 uh, persons moving into the city from the 50 states, domestic inflows. International flows, our immigration runs at 96,000 uh, on average. Remember, this is annual, okay, every year. 96,000 coming in, 120,000 births every year in the city, okay? Now on the loss side, I don't even like the word loss, it, we export people, okay? <laughs> we, be, there's a reason for that, because losses are, are deemed to be pejorative, and they're not, it's part of the cycling. We lose, no, I did it again. We export 215,000 people to the 50 states, we export, our emigration is pretty small. We are estimated to be 14,000. That is the movement out to other countries. And 53,000 people die each year. You can't do much about that. People die, people are born, right? So when you put all of this together, what you see is several hundred thousand people cycling through. Several hundred thousand people. This is a challenge only for the best and the greatest cities. This is a cycling of people that produces tremendous challenges for us, <laughs> admittedly. If you can harness the energy from those immigrants coming in, from the domestic migrants coming in, you have a real city. Cities that are able to process <laughs> this kind of churn are cities that do very well. But I'm not gonna kid you, the challenges are great. You incorporate almost 100,000 immigrants each year. It's those of you who know Elmhurst, Queens, 72% of Elmhurst is foreign born. It doesn't seem to change much. Now you know why, because people continue to show up. In fact, let me show you. Another fact, New York City will always have a large number of people who have just arrived. <laughs> it's, it's true. Um, when I talk to community groups, they wanna know why their job never ends. And I give them a, a full employment uh, demographic statistic which says every, year you're gonna be encountering a whole bunch of new people because they are new. They've come here for the first time. And they come here with dreams, they come here with desires, they come here to start businesses, they come here to work, they come here to re-energize the city. So the city generates its own, its energy as a function of this flow of population. And the big reason is New York has a really cool economy. Um, Mitchell Moss of NYU is often quoted as saying that if Things are difficult in the rest of the country. I want to be in New York because New York has so many different things that you can do. Our economy is very diverse. Uh, and because of that, we always get, we, we draw a lot of people. So what does this mean? In terms of immigration, we have 3.1 million foreign born in New York City. 3.1 million. By, that, by itself, it qualifies as like the third largest city in the United States. Just a foreign born population. 36%, or let's just say four in 10, of our immigrants got here after 2000. <laughs> All right, four in 10. And if you're from Africa, it's, on, it's half. If you're from Asia, it's 41%. These people have just gotten here. What a challenge for language. What a challenge to incorporate these people. But that's what makes New York City an incredible place. We take that energy and we utilize it. And that feeds on itself so that churn continues. I'm telling all of you this. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> this is the newest thing, and it's got us all excited. Back in 2000, half of the people who came to New York City um, came in, came from abroad, and half came from the 50 states. It's now two-thirds from the 50 states. 
okay? Two thirds. And what is the effect of this? We have experienced an injection of young people in the city, the likes of which we haven't seen in decades. <laughs> people have always gone to Manhattan. Young people have always gone to Manhattan, okay? But what's extraordinary is now the groups of young people going to the other boroughs. Let me give you an example here. What we do is we look at what we call non-family households. That is one person living alone or one person living with other people they're not related to. Where the head is under 65 years of age. Generally, it's much under 65 years of age. These are people heavily who migrate here from other parts of the US. And they are settling in a whole variety of neighborhoods. Let me just take you through. So we have Crown Heights, Bedford, Bushwick South, Bushwick North. By the way, this is a map of New York City's neighborhoods, 188 neighborhood tabulation areas, NTAs. I don't like to say neighborhoods because we get in trouble, even though we put the word neighborhoods up here. We don't, defi don't define neighborhoods because it's impossible to do so. So we created these 188 NTAs. So we got Crown Heights, Bedford, Bushwick South, Bushwick North, Williamsburg, Northside, Southside, Greenpoint, Long Island City, uh, into Sunnyside, Woodside, up into Astoria. You see all these blues? These are all big increases in young, non-family households. Central Harlem, East Harlem, Washington Heights, Bronx off the concourse, Morrisania, parts of Mott Haven, in the Bronx experiencing this. These corridors have become the home of large numbers of young people. And it's new. It's something that we've seen now over the last 10 or so years. Does anybody want to know why the Reds are here? <laughs> why we've seen declines in these households here? Aging. A lot of the non-family households, or a lot of the non-family households with heads under 65 are now aging to be over 65. So we're getting an aging of the population on the Upper West Side and the East Side that is producing actual declines in non-family households uh, with young, uh, younger heads under 65. Now, the, the, let me po uh, pose a couple of dilemmas. We are really aging. All right? The whole country is aging. But I say eternally young New York. And here's why. <laughs> Nationally, the projection from 2010 to 2040 is for a doubling of the population 65 and over. By the way, we used to call this elderly, but as it gets really personal, <laughs> my, I beg my staff to change it. <laughs> 40 million to 82 million is the Census Bureau's projection for pop 65 and over nationwide. In New York City, our projection is 41%. 41 sounds like a lot, do you realize the na national population 65 and over will double. So we see here that New York City will go from about 12%, 65 and over, to 15%. We are going to age. And we can debate all night about the size of the population in 2040, but this is not something we can really debate. It is embedded in our current age structure. We are going to age. <laughs> okay. Now, what's the effect? <clears throat> Just to give you a sense of what the issues are. New York City's median age right now, that is in 2010, was uh, 35.5. We're projecting 36.7. Not so bad. <laughs> Increase, considering the aging. Okay? The reason for this is because we have immigration and because we have domestic immigration. We have young people who are going to help keep the balance. Many of you, especially those who read The Economist uh, newspaper, know that when you have that balance, it's demographic gold, okay? In, in other words, enough young people so that the worker, the balance between workers and retirees is kept in check. Countries where it's not kept in check, currently, Japan, Germany, the median age in 2010 in Japan was 45, projected to go to 53. Half the population will be over 53 years of age. There's a very real question as to whether you can sustain your economy and sustain services to the older population with a median age this high. Germany projected to go up. Although, I must say, that if the refugees 
are incorporated into many of the countries of Central Europe, given their age structure, they could be a demographic asset to Germany and to a number of other places. Japan, not too hopeful, because there hasn't been a, a receptivity to immigration. If there was, you'd see this number would be quite different. The US overall, 37 to 41. New York City will not age as much. China, look at China, 48 from 35. The one-child policy and the marriage imbalance that was created by the desire for, for sons, and that's created a marriage imbalance, and it's affected the fertility of the country. So what's happened is that China is going to age dramatically. And just for contrast, two countries in Africa to show you how young they are and the fact that they will get older, but they'll still be very young. So demographically speaking, you can see where we are. There are cities in the US that are going through this. And my, again, without naming specific cities, there will be a number of them that will cease to be cities unless they can deal with this demographic dilemma. Now, before I show you the next slide, the last slide here, number six, I want to I want to give you a little bit of a caveat. Um, um, I, I have a professional life at the Department of City Planning that I'm very proud of. I also have like an outside professional life, okay, it's where I push the envelope on some things, okay. This is an illustration of where I'm going to push the envelope a little bit, okay. Um, I could spend a lot of time on this what I'm going to show you, but I'm really not I, because I want I don't want to sugarcoat anything. We have it really good in the city demographically. We really do, and we should all be very grateful for that. But there are things in the city that we need to mention and need to talk about. I'm going to show you a map of 1970, and I'm going to show you a map of 2010, looking at the major race groups and their distribution across the neighborhoods of the city. And the title here is Living Together, Living Apart. And we're very proud of New York's diversity. All right, And we should be. But I want to show you a big caveat to that diversity. Back in 1970, the population of the city was over 60% non-Hispanic white. Essentially, the city was a European white city. Okay? And we have these areas that we call, we call them, for want again of a better phrase, white dominant areas of the city. And there were 96 out of 188 neighborhoods in New York City. You see Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, East Bronx, Northwest Bronx, that were all essentially white bastions, 70, 80, 90% white, okay? In 2010, we looked at the transitions of those areas. So we had 96 neighborhoods that were non-Hispanic white, essentially European white. Look at how many we have in 2010, 11, okay? That's it. So in other words, they've dropped, white population has declined. Now, what have they become? You'll notice that a lot of these areas, which are colored in gray, are now green. The green is what we call integrated neighborhoods, <laughs> all right, which still have significant contingents of white population. These are essentially white, Asian, and Hispanic neighborhoods. They exclude the black population for the most part. So in other words, the black presence is very small in these neighborhoods, under 10% in these areas. And you'll notice the number of these what we call integrated areas without black presence has gone from 18 to 80. It has become the modal neighborhood in New York. The modal neighborhood in New York is white, Hispanic, and Asian <coughs> now. And you see Eastern Queens, Western Queens, <coughs> this whole area in here uh, on the uh, Brooklyn uh, Queens border. Um, that Woodhaven, for example, in here, uh, this whole corridor, the corridor here on Western Queens, Long Island City, Maspeth, Sunnyside, Woodside, uh, Douglaston, Whitestone, down into Diker Heights and uh, Bay Ridge in Brooklyn, and you see a big chunk of Staten Island. In fact, Staten Island is one of the few places where we still have some what we would call European dominant neighborhoods. So this transition has occurred but it has largely excluded the black population. Now, if you look at neighborhoods where there is some degree of integration involving the black population, and you see in 1970, there were 57 such neighborhoods. That's dropped to 42. But I want to 
incorporate here an important caveat. So integrated again means that there's, there's a white population. In this case uh, of the integrated neighborhoods, the white population uh, runs anywhere from a quarter to 40% of the total. All right? Those that include black population number only 42 now. Okay, again, they're down. But there are a number of neighborhoods in New York where the black population is continuing to live side by side with other groups with, with white population. And what's interesting about this is these are stable neighborhoods. They're not neighborhoods that are transitioning to something else. Many of them are stable. In fact, there are some corridors in the city where the number of integrated neighborhoods involving the black population are actually rising because of those young people I mentioned earlier. Okay? Those young people are going into neighborhoods side by side with black population, especially in places like Bushwick, in western Brooklyn, and therein lies a real change, potentially, that could blossom over, over this decade or next, a change in how people uh, select neighborhoods or how neighborhoods come out in terms of the overall uh, distribution. Um, I should say that right now, about a third of the black population of New York lives in integrated situations, defined again as living side by side with white population and other groups. Okay? Um, we can debate this, uh, the merits of this, the difficulties of this um, all night, but the thing I want to get across to you is that the city is diverse, but the city still has a racial divide of sorts that we all need to recognize. And it's part, in part of your decision making, in your frame of reference, you need to keep that in mind, okay? Um, and there are various reasons for this. People self-select their neighborhoods, okay? The fact of the matter is, people do may, perhaps want to live together in, in particular locations with other people they're familiar with, but some of it is obviously a function of discrimination. And we need to keep that in mind as all of you grow into your roles as leaders. Um, I would hope that the fact that you're here is indicative of the fact that you want to um, engage in a significant leadership role. But I wanted to offer you um, our myc.gov slash population, our um, main uh, web page. We're very proud of it. Um, what's called New York City Census Fact Finder, which is a tool that we have on, online where you can uh, define your own neighborhoods, draw your own neighborhoods, and come up with an uh, interactive profile. And then finally, out of respect for the U.S. Census Bureau, the U.S. <laughs> Census Bureau's website, you know, because in many ways we are very closely joined at the hip with the Census Bureau. Now I'm going to stop. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you digested some of this because, again, I should, I should tell you, these are my picks, okay? As there, other people might agree or disagree with these picks, but I wanted, I wanted to try to give you the best of what I think we have right now. Anyway, thank you very much.